Okay. So our goal today is really to unpack a little bit of what has happened in the new grade four to six curriculum and how that actually impacts or has a, a bearing on what's happening in the current grade seven curriculum. So we want to marry the two of them together. And I know that some of you are curriculum directors, so you have good knowledge already of a lot of the material that's in here, but not everybody that's here today has gone through any of the new materials. So please be patient with everyone this morning as we just unpack it. I'm not gonna go into big detail, but I do have to go back a little bit through some of the terminology that exists in the new curriculum so that you have a better idea of what it is that you're going to be looking at today. So we're gonna begin this morning with our land acknowledgement. In the spirit of reconciliation, we want to acknowledge that this gathering is taking place on traditional lands situated in Treaty 6, is where I'm coming from this morning, home to the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Dene, Métis, and Nakota Sioux. We acknowledge that this land is a traditional meeting ground, giving voice to its original peoples and the story of creation of this country since time immemorial. And for those of you who have done sessions with me in the past, you know that whenever I do the land acknowledgement, I do try to put some links onto that slide that relate to what it is that we're doing. So I've given you two. I don't usually do that, but I've given you two. The Honorable Harvest is a great one for this time of the year. It really speaks to the land and why the land is important and how we treat the land, regardless of what subject we're teaching. And the second one is a discussion about Indigenous knowledge from um, the math perspective from an Indigenous knowledge. We're not going to watch any of these this morning in the interests of time because I want you to have as much time to work together as we can. So these are probably just going to start as I advance, but we'll just get going here. So as we go through this morning, uh, what I would like to do is just quickly unpack the architecture of the new curriculum. For those who haven't seen it before, and for those who even, for those who have, there's no reason for us to think this is going to change drastically when a draft comes out for seven to nine. I would hardly think that you're going to see a whole new format. So having some exposure to it now only gives you that leg up as you're moving forward. Will there be some tweaks in language? I'm sure there will be, but we don't know what that looks like yet. Looking at how those concepts and organizing ideas are put together and how does that look different in the grade seven uh, curriculum documents that we have? What is different about them? And it's, it's definitely worthy for you to know that now because it will impact some of the things that we're going to be doing. Um, we're looking at sort of what are the key concepts and pedagogy that's been talked about. So what are the rocks that they've been unpacking in four, five, six? you're only really worried about what they've done in grade six because the students haven't done the new four and five coming to you already. We only started four, five, six last year. Now, if your school was piloting or has been doing it since the draft, then your students have done more than four, five, six once already. Um, but the feedback that we have received is about half the province already did four, five, six last year and the year before. They were working with us the year before and the other half started it last year. So again, you're gonna to have to meld that from wherever you're at in your school. We're gonna look at collaboration time and time for planning today. And this will be really doing a deep dig into a specific part of the curriculum. If we have the whole day, this part takes half the day. So, in, and even in half the day in person, we didn't get finished. So I am going to cheat and I'm going to give you some legs up to get us started to save us a little bit of time so that we can leverage the work that we do this morning for this afternoon. I'm going to share with you a little bit of some of the resources that are available to you for current, currently available to you for planning. So if you're trying to meld a little bit of, well, what exactly did that look like in grade six? We have some documents that you can use to see what that is. And so I'll share those with you we won't spend a ton of time on in the morning because it's the afternoon where we want to really pull those apart. And that's where we'll look at them. Um, we do have surveys now that we're going to ask you to do prior to the end of session. So while I'm just putting links up for you to get shared out, 
um, I'm going to ask you to complete a two minute, one minute survey. Okay, so there are, again, different places for all of you entering. Some of you are coming in as I want to know, and, and if we did this with sticky notes, some people said I want to know everything because I've never, ever even looked at the new curriculum. And that's fair. Why would you? You, you had no reason to go there. Unless you're teaching other grades and, and cross grading. What are some things that you want to know? So hopefully as we unpack the morning, some of those questions that you're thinking of right now would be hopefully answered. And if not, maybe park them for as the morning goes on and we'll leave some time at the end to answer those. And then as you walk away today, hopefully you will have learned enough to feel confident that when we come back in the afternoon, and if you're not coming back in the afternoon to work on your own, um, to actually sit down and decide, you know, does my year plan that I've been working with work? Or am I going to have to tweak some things? Or maybe in this year that you have of grace to play, should you tweak it would be a better way of questioning maybe some of the things. So as we move through today, this is a, a time for all of us just to sort of listen and learn from each other and just to grow together. Um, I have not yet done this session with any group of teachers where I haven't learned something from my colleagues as well. People see things differently. So when you are working in groups, what you read and what somebody else reads and interprets could be very different. And we tend in our own classrooms, we read something and we go. I mean, that's our job is we're supposed to teach, we plan, we do, we go. But we go from our lens that we're looking at. And sometimes it's good to hear somebody else's perspective and lens on, that's not what I'm seeing at all. And you kind of sit back and go, whoa, I did not even see that coming. So this is an opportunity for us to have those kinds of conversations today. So there is nothing that's going to be wrong that anybody can say today or do today. This is a time just to start unpacking and to learn together. So we're going to unpack old versus new. We're going to spend a fair bit of time on new first, then we'll look at old, and then we'll put the two of them together. So for those of you old enough to know what's on the left-hand side of the screen, some of you may have been around in school when we used to have typewriters that looked like that. They were called typewriters and no, they didn't plug in and no, they didn't have a screen in front of them. Um, I actually married the department that taught that. <laughs> and we kind of grew through the Apple IIEs and the laptops and everything that came through it all the way through. So things have changed. And that doesn't mean that we haven't changed. We grow with the times. And there is no profession in my world that grows as quickly as teachers do. We are the most adaptable occupation there is. We make the worst situation work. And so I think that's kudos to us and, and a good reason for us to pat ourselves on our back. We are very, very um, creative when we have to be. And I think that's one of the things that makes education so very, very powerful. And the, the job that we have is such an important, important job. So let's talk a little bit about this new curriculum. There are definitely new language that sits in the new curriculum. This isn't always language that kids need to know about, but definitely we as teachers need to know about. So there is going to be all new kinds of language. We'll unpack these one at a time, but very quickly. But this idea of this image that you're seeing of a spiral, I chose it specifically, and, and this also comes from an Alberta Ed slide. This spiraling idea is rather important because you have an opportunity to start thinking about when you are teaching, are you teaching, and I'm going to use language that I use with science because I unpack science as well, are you unpacking math in a box? Or are the kids seeing math from you in a global picture? Are we saying that here's a unit called fractions, and when fractions is done, we're done. Let's move on to something else. Or do they see how those connect? And do they meld together? And this is an opportunity for us to do that. When the new curriculum was sent out uh, or came out, we actually did some work to show teachers how they could start to scaffold some of these topics together. So let's have a look at what some of these language and these terms are. 
And this is an example of a year plan for grade six teachers. It was modeled after what Edmonton Public had done when we were on COVID. And I thought it was brilliant in the sense that they gave everyone, if you remember when we were online, they gave access to everyone to use their sort of week that they had and their week at a glance was color coded. And it was color coded to also show that different things could be happening at the same time. And so when we looked at the new curriculum and we worked with pilot teachers in the draft curriculum, they helped model this and put it together. We looked at what are some of the things that could be done at the same time and not necessarily in a box because we didn't really know all of the curriculum at that time. So when I look at this, you see that number shows up at the top and I'll unpack all the language with it, but number was pink. But in September, I see number and I see purple happening at the bottom, which is geometry. So in September, it wasn't all about number, 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 number. It was number melded with geometry, which was also melded with coordinate geometry. So the idea of putting things that could be taught together started to kind of unwind. And that's part of this so-called spiraling curriculum. We used to have that before. This is my fifth change of curriculum. So I've seen a few. Um, and we used to have a spiral curriculum. Then we went away from it. Then we went to curriculum documents and we went to outcome-based. Now, we're, So we're, we've gone back and forth and all of them have strengths. The question is, what can we glean from each one and kind of grab the best of each one? So let's look at some of the new language that you have. You had one of the documents that I asked you to upload was called the numbered outcomes document. You don't have to open it right now, but this is what I'm looking at. So if you would find it easier to go back and forth between the slides that I'm showing you and that, feel free to open it up. If you have two screens and you could definitely do it. But let's just talk about what is the language that I need to know. So the new math curriculum no longer has strands. So yes, you have strands in grade seven, but the kids coming to you didn't have strands. They had organizing ideas. So do I think organizing ideas are gonna show up in a seven to nine draft when we see it? I would venture a yes on that. I can't see us going back to strands in a different version of the seven to nine. So learning what that strand name is now called an organizing idea, those organizing ideas in the document, the curriculum document are found in those three colored bars that you find in your curriculum document at the very top. The darkest color is the organizing idea. And the organizing idea spans more than one grade. In this case, for number, it starts in kindergarten, and the same sentence goes all the way through to grade six. Nothing changes. It's a broad statement. So the analogy that I've been using all the way through is, think of opening an umbrella. Your umbrella is the organizing idea. And the rungs on that umbrella are pulling apart the different learner outcomes or the different grades that fall under that organizing idea. I should maybe just back up one. How do I know which organizing idea I'm working with? It comes right behind the words. You see organizing idea, the very first word behind it comes number. The strands that you have now, with the exception of number and statistics, really don't exist anymore. They have been reorganized. So when you think patterns, it has some connections to what you did before, but there are some differences as well. So you're going to have to learn, I have patterns and relations in grade seven, but that doesn't exist as an organizing idea. So where did all of my patterns and relations go? Like, where does it live? And that's part of the work that we'll do today. Below that, the middle color, gets a little bit lighter, it's called the guiding question. The guiding question is specific to each grade. So whether I teach kindergarten or grade six, I have a common organizing idea at the top, but the question that is there sits for my grade. 
And that question is not an I can to be reworded as an I can statement for the kids on the board. This is for you, the teacher. When you read the guiding question and you think about how you would answer that question, how you would answer it should impact how you're going to plan. That's the intent of that organizing or that guiding question. The learner outcome is the last colored row that you see below that. And the learner outcome is that one thing we are familiar with. It is the, what do I need to report on? This is what they have to be able to do. This is what I'm going to report on in my report card. And this is what I need to be able to say, yes, they have met all the criteria for this learner outcome for me to say, check, meeting, exceeding, whatever, like however, whatever language you're using at your school. So when I'm looking at that learner outcome, it is specific to each grade, again, just as it would be. And it's very sequential. And when you see this layout of the documentation, you'll see that grade five and six, for example, are on the same page. The learner outcome for grade five sits right beside the learner outcome in grade six. So I can see how are they growing from five to six? And we would anticipate seven, eight, nine would be the same. How are they changing from six to seven, seven to eight, eight to nine, just as you would have in, in most of the curriculum documents we see now. Sometimes it's a subtle verb change, and that verb is everything in how you approach what you're going to teach. So if you look at your learner outcome, you'll see that there are three columns below each of those learner outcomes. One is called knowledge, the second one is understanding and skill and procedures. And together, those form the word CUSP. So when you hear the acronym CUSP, that's really what people are talking about. They're talking about what is it that lives in my grade under knowledge, understanding, skill, and procedures. That's the same pieces as your general learner outcome, specific outcome that you have in your current curriculum. So it's unpacking it in new language is really what we're doing. So let's look at the left-hand column called knowledge. Knowledge is just that. It could be the definition. It could be the students will be able to blah. It is, this is what I got to teach. It's the knowledge piece of what the kids need to have to move forward. So it's, and it's not designed, and I'm going to say it more than once today, it's not designed, this whole curriculum is not designed to be turned into a checklist. It is not, I did this one in knowledge check. Go to the next one. Oh, I did that one check. Now I'm going to go over to the skill side. It is designed to be done as one unit together. And so by that, I'll unpack a little bit more. So the middle column is called the understanding. And the understanding of the three columns is the most important column. The understanding is often a general statement. And it's general in the sense that it doesn't say bullet, 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 bullet but it encompasses the knowledge and skills and procedures that the student needs to be able to do. So if I'm saying to, a, to my admin or to my parent or to my student, you've met this understanding, I am saying that you have done the knowledge and combined skills and procedures together, and you have demonstrated that learning to me in a variety of different ways, which we'll talk about. So that understanding is really the key column. The skill and procedure, we're not, well, I'll just finish the understanding. Here's an example of the understandings. Understandings will be different if I have more than one row of cusp, and I'll, I'll address that in just a moment. But let's say I had the concept of multiplication, division, decimal numbers, and algorithms. Those are four concepts, four big ideas, four big rocks. The understanding might be a simple statement that puts those four terms, those concepts, into one statement. And that's why we say that that middle column is the more important one. It's the connection in some kind of logical order of those particular concepts that are being presented. The skills and procedures, that's not really new to us the number that you have are going to be new to you. So the skill and procedure 
really is how am I going to unpack this for the student? What does the student have to show me they can do? The no is on the left, the do is on the right. And the no and the do together build my understanding. The do has some very explicit verbs in it. And in the new curriculum, those verbs need to be assessed. They don't have to be assessed as a single test or something like that, but you do have to be able to assess the student's ability to solve, the student's ability to represent, the student's ability to model. So it could be all encompassed in a question, but you're, you need to be able to assess those verbs, which means that I don't just take knowledge and teach fact, 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 fact. I have to be cognizant of what is over on the right-hand side. How are they asking me to unpack that knowledge? If it says to investigate, that is not putting a definition on the board, giving me an example, and then saying, start doing some questions. That is far from an investigation. An investigation means I get to muck my way through this first and give you what I've learned. And then you're going to try and clarify along the way, maybe by asking some probing questions to get me where I need to go instead of just telling me what it needs to be. So those verbs are really key. There is something we need to pay attention to. And I do have some slides for you to unpack those a little bit further. So when I look at any learner outcome, I have that knowledge, understanding, skill, and procedure. If you glance at your um, numbered outcomes document, any place, you could just take the first page, you will see that sometimes there's more than one row of those cusps. And each time I go to a new row, the understanding is different. The knowledge is different, the skill and procedure, and yet it all belongs to the same learner outcome. Not always do they have more than one, but many, many do. So that means that a learner outcome could have a whole bunch of these rows, and I need to work my way through in a logical order to unpack it to make sense for the students. No different than what I do with my current grade seven curriculum when I unpack it and put it into an order that makes sense. So when we talk about unpacking, we're going to come back and forth to this a little bit on and off. How students learn are really three different levels of learning. This language that you are seeing will show up in a variety of places. In science, in four to six, we have, or in science K to six period, we have premised everything on surface deep and transfer learning. We've done the same in math in the resources that we're sharing with you. So that's why I'm going to go through this just overview. I'm not going to go into this in depth. But when Hattie uh, did his meta-analysis and he came up with all of those different teaching strategies that really made a difference in how kids learned, one of the things that he worked on and Julie Stern worked on at the same time was how do kids learn? So it's fine for me to know what strategies I should use, but how do they learn? And how much time am I spending in each of those areas? This goes back to our university years when we first learned to be a teacher. So surface learning is everybody's got to do surface learning. It doesn't matter whether I teach grade 12, and I used to be a pat dip teacher for 39 years, whether I teach anything in those courses or I teach kindergarten, everybody is surface level when it's something new. New is surface level. I'm just learning. And that's what surface means. Teach me the basic concepts meaning. Give me whatever I need to know to just work my way through it and just get a basic understanding, the foundation. You can't ask me to apply in math if I don't have the foundational understanding. So that's where I'm getting it from in that surface learning. Surface learning is not just definitions. It could be teaching me what does represent mean. So teach me what a verb is. I need to learn about that too. And in grade seven, that would be an ideal year. This would be an ideal year to really unpack some of those verbs when you have a fairly familiar uh, curriculum to you already why not take some of those and try to unpack some of them in a different way? Just because I unpack a verb doesn't mean I'm out of surface, doesn't mean I did something more difficult. I'm still teaching you just the foundations. 
I could even take a Venn diagram, which is one of the most powerful ways that we can assess a student and ask a very basic question and still keep it at surface level. So it's how you ask the question that will determine that. We have three levels. Nobody can avoid surface, but surface are the easiest questions to assess. They're easy to make multiple choice from. They're easy to make true and false. They're easy to make fill in the blank. They're easy to give you a question and just change the numbers in the question and have students pattern along to solve problems. Those are surface level questions. That tells you I got the basics, but that doesn't mean I can actually do anything with it as far as an application. And that's where we get into deep. Once I'm convinced that you have a good understanding of just the raw stuff, you've got the language. Now we wanna take the language and put those concepts together. That's that application side. And that is what we call deep learning. And deep learning isn't really anything more difficult. It just means I'm taking multiple concepts and putting them together in a question. And now I'm gonna give them to you in a new question, not a new question that is the same format with just different numbers. That is not a new question. That goes back to surface level because if I'm a memorizer, I'm gonna just learn, oh, Mrs. Z makes her question this way. All that she did was change the numbers and I solved it this way in the example. So I'm gonna do it the same way. That's patterning. That's not learning. That's surface level. So if I want to really make sure that you are understanding, I need to give you a new scenario, not change it from basketball to football. That's not necessarily going to be the, the, a different change. Often, when I worked at Alberta and I worked in assessment, and one of the things that at the time that I was there, one of the things that we would get is phone calls, and I'm sure they still do, after PAD or DIP exams. And the first thing that we would hear is, we, our class average was 85. They wrote the test and we're at 60 something. Like what the heck, you guys wrote a horrible exam. Always a possibility. But they go through such scrutiny of field tests that you can almost predict what the average could be on some of those. So the question then becomes, why were the kids so high if they weren't able to do these questions and they're just sort of down at an average level? And more than not, it comes from, if you go back and look at the assessment, the assessments were the same kinds of questions as the examples over and over and over. So a memorizer got it. But when you go to a pat and a dip, they're giving you multiple concepts together in a question. They're not giving you just straight answer kinds of questions. You do get some, but not the majority. So this is the world that we want to spend most of our time in is giving them lots of examples and not telling them how to do it. Maybe give them the example and if they say, I don't know where to start, well, what do you know? Let's unpack it, but let them work their way through it. Let them be a little bit frustrated with it. That's a teaching piece. That's not something that, if students know you well enough and just say, I'm not answering anything, I'm not putting my hand up because when I wait Mrs. Z out, she'll just give me the answer eventually. And you have kids that will do that. They will wait you out because they know you're going to give them the answer. But what if you don't? So what can you tell them to get them going without telling the whole process? So surface is kind of like that 10, 15% of what we teach, something new. Sort of 80% lives in deep. If you are a school that uses DOK, DOK level one is kind of that surface level. The two, three is that middle level. Everybody at the end of a first lesson, even when I'm teaching you new terminology, should have asked at least one level two question somewhere before they left your class that day. Don't leave me at level one forever. That's an easy place to live, but that doesn't mean I'm necessarily gonna understand. And then when I wanna mark them, I have to mark them. I still have to give them a report card mark. I still have to say they've achieved something. This is where we take a deep question and call it transfer. So a lot of times people say, well, isn't that more difficult? Or do they have to be harder questions? The answer is no. If I've done five, six different deep kinds of scenarios with you and you ace them every time, I don't need to keep giving you more because obviously you understand. So I'm ready to mark you. 
up until now, it might be formative assessment. So now I'm ready to mark you and give you a question that again is completely different. And now I want you to try and solve that. So that's where they have to draw on what you've taught them, apply it, somehow figure their way through this. And they've, but if they've given you, if you've given them tons of examples on that already, it's a no brainer for them. That's practice. Maybe that's new to you as well. Maybe you want to try that with your existing lesson plans you have right now. Back off in an area that maybe you tended to always give up more of a stand-up deliver and back off and see how might you switch that around just a little bit. Just tweak it a bit. Try it. Just see if it works. So it's kind of like a 10-80-10 if you kind of want to break it. And I'm not saying it's a perfect match that way. So when we looked at the grade four to six, and all I did is I grabbed the big rocks. I didn't grab everything. What you're seeing in the yellow and orange are the big rock concepts that live in grades four, five, and six. But when you're looking at these, I'll bet some of you are saying as grade seven teachers is, hmm, uh, that's exactly what I teach. And it's true. That's exactly what you're teaching. So have they seen some of exactly what you're teaching? They sure have. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about where that might be. The ones that are in the dark orange are the skills. These are not all the skills. I will show you where all of them are. But these are the most common ones and the big rocks. And again, I'm going to say to you, math and science go hand in hand. Students should never leave a math class saying, I did an investigation today, and then I never see it again. We do investigations in science. We should use the same language. So kids see that they're connecting these types of things together. This is not a one-off for math or one-off for science. Representing, modeling, you represent in language arts, you represent in all kinds of subjects. So students should see these verbs, these actions show up in a variety of different places. We won't go to it right now, but when you get the slide deck, and I will share this with you, anything that's hyperlinked like this, the math verbs, we have definitions of these verbs. So if you're looking for a way to explain it, to make it a little bit more consistent across the province, we offer that um, document to you so that you have the same sort of language that anybody in the province would be using. So keeping in mind, we have these verbs that live in here and we have some of these topics. What I'd like to start with very quickly is two documents that I asked you to have on your uh, desktop this morning. The first one is that familiar document you use right now that is your grade nine, K to nine program of studies. But at the front of that program of studies is your front matter. And I'll lay my last dollar that some of us haven't spent a lot of time looking at that since we left university. You spend a ton of time going through it when you're doing those first unit plans. But once we get into our classrooms, we get our assignments, we go straight to those learner outcomes. And so it's been a while since some of us have even looked at this. Now, I don't want to say, I want you to read 27 pages. I want you to skim through just looking at maybe some of the top titles that are in there. The other one was the introduction. This is the new front matter for the new curriculum for grades four, for K to six. It's the same for all of them. So I'd like you to read, just skim through your familiar old document first, but then I would like you to take a read through the new one. So we're going to give you some time to do that. Uh, I'm not going to just say you've got a minute. So we're at sort of 944. So why don't we say we'll come back at 10 o'clock. That'll give you a chance to skim, read if you need to go grab a coffee, come back. Uh, and then we'll do that just to give you a chance to read it through. But the one to read through in its entirety would be the new one. I want you just to have a sense of what that says and, and how do you see that compare to what your old one says. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, I'll stop the recording and then we'll see you back at 10 o'clock. About lifelong learning, yeah. Okay, front matters more understanding, thinking, choosing strategies, great. Okay. 
And I agree with you that the new front matter is really quite concise. Um, it really does say exactly the same thing. A lot of people said, well, where did the processes go? The processes are actually implied in that front matter. Um, this is something that uh, isn't, it isn't gone. It's there. It just isn't three pages long. So we still have those important verbs that we need to unpack. That hasn't changed. Okay. So it gives you a little bit of a sense of those would be the same for kindergarten to grade six. I'd like to just quickly spend just a minute on the numbered outcomes document, just telling you what the difference is between this and if you were to go to New Learn Alberta. So in New Learn Alberta, it's exactly the same colors. This is New Learn Alberta's document, curriculum document from their website. The only difference is that it has been numbered, hence the name. And the reason it was numbered is when we worked with the draft version first, and we were working with teachers and we were working with uh, consultants, there were no page numbers. And these not being numbered, we were forever saying count down seven pages, count down five rows, and then we'd have to read to make sure that we were all on the same page. And it was frustrating. So we went through and we numbered the outcomes document. So it's not different. If anything, it just makes it easier for you if you're working with a colleague, especially if you're not in the same school and you want to plan together, you can simply reference the number and then you both know that you're on the same page. So how I read this is, first of all, and I'll just use the one that's on my screen right now, that I'm at the very front page of grade six number. So if you even want to scroll there on your screen, it might be easier for you to see on your own screen. You're going to have to go down quite close to the bottom of the document, find the grade five, six pages where they start. And the very first one that comes up is number. So in number, when I look at how I read this document, the very first number that you see is a six. That tells you the grade. If you look at grade five, you'll see a five in the front of it. If you go to kindergarten, there's a K in front of it. So whatever the lead is, is the grade that you are looking at or is being referenced. The next one is the, the organizing idea. So N for number, ST for stats, P for patterns. They're quite obvious. So it should be fairly easy for you to figure out which ones they're at. Behind that is a number. And in some cases, there's a number. In some cases, there's a decimal. So if you were to look at the grade five, I see 5N1. But when I go over to grade six, I see 5N1.1. So a decimal simply means that there are multiple rows of cusps below that learner outcome. Remember, the learner outcome never changes. So the learner outcome reads, students investigate magnitude with positive and negative numbers. There's a cusp right there, knowledge, understanding, skill, and procedure. But now I have another row of knowledge, understanding, skill, and procedures with exactly the same thing. Students investigate magnitude, positive, and negative numbers. But now it's a new understanding it moves further in the knowledge. It moves further in the skills and procedures. And then I have yet another row. So just to make it easy to tell what row you're in, the decimal is that indicator. It doesn't change the learner outcome. It just tells you what row of cusps you are in. And for some of them, it's important because in grade five, for example, they have eight rows in some cases. So it's really hard to figure out where you're at unless you have a reference point. So that's the only purpose of this. That's the only thing that's different is that we just numbered it to make it easier for you to find. Everything else is cut and paste directly from the, the new Learn Alberta site. So that's how that document works so you have an idea. So here is gonna be your next quick challenge. And this is gonna be quick because you'll do more of it with your group. But I do want you to take a few minutes Find in your numbered outcomes document on your screen, find where grade four starts. So you're gonna be scrolling through for a bit until you hit the three fours. And I'd like you just to skim through what is the learner outcome all the way through to grade four, then go into grade five, six. And remember in grade five, six, you can read across. I want you just to get a quick 
overall sense of what is in grade four, five, six. You'll unpack it more in depth in a minute. So don't panic if you don't get through absolutely everything, but it will take you a few minutes to do that. So we're at five after 10 right now, and I don't wanna spend more time on this until we get into the group. So 10, 15, I'd like you to come back. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll just really get into this, but you need a little bit of time to read it through to get your, your legs into it if you've never seen it before. So 10, 15, we'll come back and we'll do the same uh, piece of work that we're gonna look at for the groups. Hopefully, everything isn't gone wonky, chat included. All right, so what I'd like to do now is you're going to be breaking out into smaller groups. These are the, top, the, the organizing ideas that you've seen as you went through the different um, parts of the document that you just had a look at. And as we go through these, you're realizing that a lot of that is your grade seven material. So the question is how deep, how much, and what's left for me really to still teach? And that's kind of the key of where we need to be at the beginning of this year. So you're going to get a slide deck. I'm gonna try sharing it. If not, uh, let me just make sure that you're still a co-presenter there, Sandra. Uh, what we're going to do, oh, I'm just going to make sure Sandra's on there. Sorry, guys, I'm just going to make her a co-presenter to make sure she is. Okay, so I'm going to give you a slide deck. You're going to keep this slide deck. Now, here's the thing you need to remember about the slide deck. All of you are editors. You are all going to get a link to it. You're going to go into a breakout room, and one of you is going to record on your sheets, and I'll explain that in just a moment. So as you're recording, it would be better if not all of you opened it up because that's the one thing with Google is that if you have too many people accessing the same document at the same time, it gets a little wonky. But we have used this process and it works very well. So you each will have a breakout room. You're just gonna be randomly assigned to it. And in that breakout room, you'll be assigned to a specific topic or organizing idea. And what I'd like you to do in that organizing idea is really unpack it. Find out what did they learn? What is grade seven? What have they not done that I still have to do? Because there are still definitely pieces that I need to teach in grade seven. That's not going to go away. Uh, or is there? Is it done? You know, as, as Henry pointed out, like a lot of this stuff is done. So if, if it's done, then what? So where do I go with it? So you're going to have one person type into the document. All of you can open it and look at it, but you don't really need to, and, and it might jump around a lot on you. So you've got two things to look at. What's been covered, and what do I still need to do? And if it's the whole thing that I did before, like circles, still got to do that because they didn't do any of that. So I still have that unit to cover. You're going to review what your colleagues have already done. And by that, I mean, remember, this was a full day session. So you don't have the privilege of going through and doing all of those areas. They did. So I'm going to give you the answers or the comments that your previous four groups have already done. So you're going to kind of get a cheat sheet. But my comment to you will be some of those cheat sheets are a little bit vague, I think, personally. Some of them have some maybe not completely correct assumptions on them. Your job is to go in and edit. If you look at it and say, oh, this works perfectly, I totally understand. As a brand new person into this process, then you're good to go. But if you read it and say, hmm, I'm not sure I understand exactly what they meant, feel free to edit, feel free to type out, to add in, delete, whatever your group feels you need to do, you will be the expert on that particular organizing idea. So one person types, one person gets to be the reporter. So you can fight that one out who gets to be that person. 
So there'll be six breakout rooms and hopefully it's gonna let me do that. If not, Sandra, I'll lean on your co-presenter there. Six breakout rooms. You just need to remember what room number you are and what it is. You're gonna have this slide deck so you can always go back on the slide and I'm in room two, room two. Oh yeah, we're doing measurement. When you get the document, it will look something like this. So here's an example of the work that's been done for you and that you're gonna be able to edit. So in algebra, the groups decided that they would write down everything that's been done in algebra, especially if it related to grade seven. So here are all the things that they covered and here was their conclusion of what still needed to be done. Does that give you enough information? Do you need more information? Do you feel that if somebody were to take your work, would they get enough information from that? Okay. So you need somebody who's going to record, somebody who's going to report. In this time frame, your group can decide to take a break as well. You're going to get a slide deck that looks like this. You have blank sheets in there. If you need to duplicate a sheet, you have full editing rights. So you just need to go to the room that you are going to be in. So let me see if I can get us into breakout rooms here without a hassle. All right, so randomly, all right, so I'm going to open the rooms now. Now, before we do that, let me grab this for you. Sandra, do you want to put that in the chat box just in case? the link that I sent you, just make sure that everybody can get it. I'll let you all grab that first from your chat box. Now you're all editing into this. So at the end of this session, you all will get that copy to keep. You have everybody's answers. So that's the purpose of doing it the way we did. Did it let you put it in, Sandra? Yeah, it's in there and it looks like there's 30 people in already. Okay, perfect. All right, so let me open up the chat box or the uh, oh, the breakout rooms for you so that you can go in. Is there anybody who's unclear about what to do? So we're going to come back at 11.20. So that gives you just under an hour to work as a team and to have a look at, uh, take a bit of a break in there as well. All right, so I'll give you a warning when we come back again. Okay, so they should be open. You should see them. I'm going to take another shot here, Sandra, and see if this will work in the chat box. I have no idea why this isn't working. Can you see it? Yep, that works. Okay. It's there. Got it sorted out. Oh, I don't know what that's all about. Yep, that's good. Okay, room five. Um, and Chris, because you added me as co-presenter, I don't see our room to join. It just pops up with which rooms are there. So you can join any room you like. Okay, thank you.
If we can just do a very quick run through whoever your speaker is going to be, um, just you don't have to necessarily read every line, but what was it that you are, remember keeping in mind more as a grade seven teacher, what do I need to know about those grade sixes? Um, and this would be a different conversation if we were having it in two years from now, because again, they would have done two years of new curriculum, very different conversations. So we're looking at it as grade sixes coming to you this year from last year. What did your group decide? So whoever our speaker for algebra is, if you want to unmute yourself and the floor is yours. Or did we decide who our speaker would be? I don't think we did. We got so caught up in talking about all the different things that we wanted to look at. Um, I'll just speak really briefly on like the fact that like linear wasn't commonly used. That was a word that we noticed was missing. Um, and then we also noticed that there is a missing of like using concrete and pictorial representations. Um, so something we talked about was like how in grade nine, there's a lot of use of like math manipulatives and you see kind of like a little bit of a gap there. Um, and another thing we looked at and just discussed was just how the role of calculators is going to change and like to what extent are we using calculators versus are we expecting the students to have um, that math literacy and being able to understand the numbers on their own? And then how does that one day play into things like the grade nine PAT? So right. We just kind of like we looked everywhere. We bounced for all the way from grade five to grade nine. Okay. And those are really good points, Jennifer. Right now, in case you're not aware, K to six is calculator free. There is no technology to be used. Now, it could be done if it was an IPP. Um, but again, that has to be substantiated. So they are expecting the students to really have a good understanding of the math and the procedures, strategies that they're going to use to solve those questions. Whether that carries through into junior high, uh, I guess we have to wait and see, right? As they get older, obviously, the technology serves a purpose. So I can't see that being the end all be all that we're going to do no technology. So I guess we'll have to wait and see where the next round of um, draft materials comes to and goes to. So really good points. Um, it isn't suggested anywhere that manipulatives are done. But if you go from kindergarten through to grade six from the beginning, it smacks you in the face that this is very hands-on curriculum. So there will be a number of students, if the teachers have been sort of following that mindset, that will be coming to you with a ton of visual hands-on learning experience. So that begs the question this afternoon, where does that fit into my current teaching? Do I do that, tons of that already? Is this my year of let's play and learn together uh, where I bring it in? Um, and we'll, we'll look at a slide for that. Great, thank you very much. Let's have a look at measurement. Who's our speaker for measurement? I don't think that we had chosen one either, Chris. We got talking as well. Um, our big takeaway of still to be done is the area, uh, or sorry, the unit on circles. And um, there's no demonstration of an understanding of circles that's been studied, as well as developing and applying a formula for developing the area of circles. Right. And then when we get into uh, what's currently Shape and Space 3, where they perform geometric constructions, some of it is done in earlier grades in terms of finding perpendicular lines with folding paper. But the use of the compass and the protractor really has to be developed and worked on in grade seven. That's right. In three years from now, students will have mastered that because they will have been doing work already. They've done the work with the protractors. It's just your students coming to you missed those grades. So right. good point. Yeah. So that's going to be an area that's very similar to what you've been doing in the past, for sure. We also noticed that... Uh, Coming up to us, they'll have worked on volumes of prisms, which is not a grade seven concept. It's currently in grade eight. So we had talked maybe about, you know, developing that a little bit more, reviewing volume 
even though it's not an outcome that we would currently assess in grade seven. I, I totally agree with you. And that should be a light bulb for all of us. If you're seeing that in grade six, not hard to figure out in the absence of a draft, kind of what's coming. <laughs> right. It's going to have to fall in line, right? So you kind of see where this flow could go for sure. Yeah, good point. I would definitely spend some time on that. Okay. All right, number, it's a big one. We know it's a big one, but let's focus on from a perspective of grade six is coming into grade seven. Who's our spokesman for number? Anybody from the team want to take a leap out there and talk about it? Uh, I guess I can. Um, I was writing the things down, but that's okay. I guess I can do both. Um, for number, we noticed there was a whole bunch of things that were already done um, in previous grades. We went beyond just looking at the grade six um, because some of the things did come up earlier on, um, like divisibility rules, uh, they cover some of them, but not all of them. So you need to like finish that up. Um, the multiplying and dividing without technology, like some of the number outcomes, uh, especially I was looking at the um, assessment and reporting guide, which breaks down all of the outcomes a little bit more, do say that you could use technology when appropriate in our current one. Um, so you could possibly still bring that in um multiplying and dividing with decimal numbers they don't actually do that in grade six they uh, stick with whole numbers so that's still something that is strictly grade seven um lots of like comparing ordering converting in between um decimals and fractions um percents as well even though technically those come up in other grades i don't know if they're quite as um, robust as in the grade seven, where you're like really trying to mix all of them together and showing them all the connections, putting them on number lines, showing how they all relate and that kind of stuff. Um, on the second slide, because we had so much in number, um, there was a bit more. Uh, two that were already in there, or three, I guess, were it said multiplying and dividing fractions. That's not in grade seven. Um, that's in grade eight. But in the grade six curriculum, they do start multiplying fractions by natural numbers. Right. So you could start bridging that a little bit if you wanted to, uh, even though the grade seven mostly focuses on adding and subtracting with mixed numbers and improper fractions that don't have common uh, factors in their denominators. So they'll have looked at stuff with like common factors like two fourths plus uh, seven eighths. So you can easily do the math to double the one to be able to add with common denominators. Um, but in grade seven, we're still doing like three sevenths plus two fifths or something like that. So where they don't have that common um, factor. Uh, they do a lot of factoring previous. So hopefully you won't have to spend too much time on determining what the factors of numbers are. They'll hopefully mm -hmm. have that already. Um, and then it's just more applying what they know about factors into all these other things in grade seven. Good job. Number two. <laughs> Good job for catching the errors because that was uh you weren't part of that discussion, but when this came up, that was one of the things that I said to them, is that really part of your grade seven curriculum? Um, and, you know, I mean, we all get into comfort zones and we teach certain things. It's just like tessellations. We've got lots of people that teach tessellations in grade eight right now, which is not part of your curriculum. It's in your book, but it's not part of your curriculum. Your book is not the curriculum. So, Again, we get into a comfort zone of teaching some things. So yes, these are definitely grade eight. Um, they do, in grade six, do decimals uh, and division. What they're doing is dividing by natural numbers. So they can take a decimal number up to three digits. And there's your limit. That's why they wrote limit here. 
So it can have a three digit number, which could be 1.27, could be 0 0.127, whatever, but they can't divide a decimal by a decimal. So they, they do a fair bit of work on that. Um, the grade fours do a ton of work on percentages, fractions, decimals on number lines, equivalents accordingly. And money is the driver of that one. So they would, in theory, in three years from now, have pretty strong understanding of things that uh, we haven't maybe dug deeper into um, in our current curriculum. Yep, good job. There are definitely things that still need to be done, the divisibility rules for sure. I have a question. If yeah. you could just go back one slide, please, Chris. You bet. Uh, said grade five divisibility rules, uh, zero, two, three, five, ten. Now our kids didn't do the grade five new curriculum coming exactly. up. So uh, in terms of still needs to be done in grade seven, it's a whole we thing. assume that they haven't done divisibility rules. That's right. Exactly. Okay. Thank so you. It, in a perfect world, in, in two years from now, if it, nothing had changed, then you wouldn't have to worry about it. But for the coming year, they didn't get that grade. So yes, unless the teacher, you'd need to talk to the teacher and say, you know, did you go back and do that? And if they didn't, well, then absolutely, you're going to, you're just going to do your same divisibility rules that you've always done in grade seven. Okay, thank you. You bet. All right, let's move to statistics. Who's speaking on behalf of statistics? You know, we didn't get to that conversation, but if the other two don't mind, maybe I'll just jump in. Sure. Um, you know, like many others, we we certainly did a lot of talking around all of this before we really got into the guts of it. Um, but uh, this first page, like this, some of this is what previous people have done. And, and I think it's really important to point out what they're saying, essentially. You know, some things have certainly been done here, but in the grade seven curriculum, it's median mean row range data sets. That stuff hasn't been covered yet. Uh, right. Outliers is not in the grade six curriculum. Um, and then the idea of sample spaces with two, um, two variables that you're measuring for. Um, and then independent events. Um, is this the same as the one I have? I don't know. Seems like... Yeah, like probability data. I don't know. You have one that's not similar to us. I also added in there, like, there's a new term there, like relative frequency. Oh, um, I might have a different one here. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, which doesn't seem to appear there. Um, and then we also added another slide where we started breaking it down there and just going, well, what are the grade fours? What are the grade five? What are the grade sixes? Threw in the grade sevens there. And then we were about to get to the place we were talking about you know, what are these new concepts that we need to be make, focusing on in grade seven? So we didn't really flush all that out um, quite yet, but the previous slide, they had got to that place more so, um, which is helpful. So the terminology to think about for this afternoon is that relative frequency. Mm -hmm. We don't want to go into saying, oh, relative frequency is the same thing as experimental pre frequency. So I'm just going to use that term. But it it does cause some issues because our books are saying experimental. Some say relative. So it really will determine or also complicate things by looking at what resource you're going to be using. But the correct or the uh, most correct term now will be relative frequency. And the other one is expected frequency. Expected frequency would be replacing your theoretical frequency. And in actual uh, examples of that, we actually put it in there because it just seemed counterproductive when we went through the entire curriculum um, to see relative frequency and they allude to, they talk around, but they never actually name it, the expected frequency. So in the CPAR documents, which we'll talk about in just a minute and even more so this afternoon, we actually put examples in there for you as teachers to see what those would look like and you're more than welcome to use those. Great job. Okay, patterns. Uh, I guess that would be me, but could you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. 
We'd spent more time on looking at the grade six to grade seven rather than the four and five uh, because we got into conversations as well. So that's why I just wanted you to go to that slide. So the previous slides was done by um, the other group, but I get I have not taught grade six. So some of the comments um, about the grade six curriculum was that this is a section where it seemed to be vague and, and ambiguous and, and where the old curriculum is a little bit more explicit as to what may be needed to be taught. And so one of the first lines still needs to be done in grade seven. The only thing that was there when we looked at these slides was about the a language piece, which we totally agreed with, is that um, probably the language needs to be emphasized and introduce the new language, such as the function, the independent and uh, dependent variables, because that is not in the um, grade seven curriculum. So maybe being consistent with that. Um, everything is kind of listed there are some of the things that need to be focused on, like uh, linear equations, bringing in that real life perspective, being able to analyze graph, draw a, gra a graph, but more or less come up with conclusions as to what is that graph representing. There are still those words about um, preservation of equality and modeling concretely, pictorially, symbolically. Um, in the old curriculum or the grade seven curriculum, it really emphasizes the difference between expression and equation and really what those equations are um, of one step, two step equations. So there is another slide in there, but it just goes into the difference between one step and two step equations. I think that where we got hung up in our conversation was where do you find the resources when you are looking at something that can end up being a little bit vague and up to interpretation. And that's it. No, that's great. And functions was a, a head scratcher for us. And we even went back to Albert Ed and, and asked, you know, is that really the term you want to throw in here at this point? Because it really does change how we define things and we have to unfold things for students. But no, that is where we went. Um, yeah, we didn't understand that word too much about function either, because it could go many different directions, I guess. And you can't get too complicated because they are only grade six and grade seven. But that being said, um, it does fit well into what they do in patterns. It does fit well into the tables of values. And when we talk about frequency and input output machines and blah, 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 um, you can get that. So again, some of those examples of clarity uh, will come through what we call a CPAR document. And we will look at one of those right away here, just as soon as we've done all the, the different groups. Um, geometry, that's our last group. They've got geometry and coordinate geometry. Who's our yes. speaker for this that's group? That's me, Kenya. All right, Kenya. Okay, so our team was uh, very rich in participation. We distributed the task in like analyzing grade four and what do we have from the grade seven curriculum, grade five and grade six. So three different sub teams. Then we shared our, our findings. And well, as the slides say, we basically found all of the content except uh, constructions uh, somewhere in between the grade four, five, six new curriculum. Uh, but there are some important considerations here. So there is a lot of review to be done in grade seven. So first of all, do not assume our students will bring all of that content just as it, it's been measured mentioned before, uh, most of the students have only uh, had like grade six new curriculum. So they'll have that four and five gap. Um, so in grade seven, make sure that when you're teaching geometry, like still consider teaching all of the grade seven content, just that our students will have uh, some background knowledge already. Uh, for coordinate geometry, though, and that's a slightly different story, like it's basically all covered. So the suggestion here, and we had some like grade seven teachers and grade nine teachers in our team, is that 
um, don't skip the the content, but devote less time since we noticed all of the outcomes were covered in the new curriculum for elementary. So coordinate geometry, even though it's all taught before, or at least that's said, uh, don't skip it. Teach it with less time, but don't skip it. Then going back to the geometry uh, organizing idea, uh, another suggestion is like take advantage that our students will have uh, prior knowledge and go a step further with real life applications, examples with nature. Also, um, and this is a, a, like a piece, a piece of advice from, from a grade nine teacher and, and her experience is that circle geometry is um, like a big unit in grade nine. It's usually taught in a difficult time of the school year because it it doesn't quite go along with other units. So it's taught like in isolation. So the the advice here it here is that as we're teaching introductory topics, like make sure that our students in grade seven, know their lines and triangles content really well. They like they bring that from elementary years. So when they get to grade seven, and if you find that your students have lots of checks with the curriculum content, then go and review elements about lines, about triangles, about uh, angles, because that will really support circle geometry which is a tough unit. And we know that when it gets to grade nine PATs, that's a big piece of the, the content too. So big, big and like bold letters, I put circle geometry. So we all contribute to that. So that would be one of the major focuses that we can put into in the grade seven teaching that we do. And that's, all from our part. Awesome, great job. So this document that you have right now, we're going to ask you to, I will make another copy of it so that you can, uh, we can just share it with anybody who's coming in the afternoon. But you're going to use this document this afternoon when we look at planning, like what could a year plan look like in grade seven, given everything that you just quickly kind of gone through. We will go through it in a little more depth. We'll use a, a, another document that we'll be able to uh, work from. So having said that, um, there are different angles that you're going to come at this because, again, depending on where you teach, if the school has been doing this for more than one year already, they're, they're not just grade six coming to grade seven. This is five, six already gone through. This changes what you see. So having that four or five background is really, really important for us to see. If you're looking for what depth would they have done or could they have done in a four or five, I will show you where you can see what that looks like fairly quickly. So let me just go back then to, hopefully our slide deck. And I see I've been kicked back out. So what I'd like to do now is just to finish up our morning. I'm just gonna jump to when we talked about what are some of the hands-on things that students could be, should be, maybe looking at using. Some of that will come from the verbs that we were seeing. And so we saw sort of the big rock verbs. And when I look at all of the verbs that really live right now in that grade six curriculum and kind of randomly group them, I'm not saying you couldn't move some of these to other locations, you definitely could. But in the coming year, 
that would be something to think about. Even if you taught exactly the same lesson unit the way you did before, paying attention to the language of the verbs that are there and seeing how you might implement that in your lesson could be a small tweak. Again, for you and for them, because some of this will be just changing the way we present it. The other piece would be, what manipulatives are you using? What ones could you throw in now as a consideration for units that you're teaching? So ones that the students are being pretty much inundated with. Number one, quiz and air rods. And a lot of times junior high, the last three sessions I did, teachers said to me, I don't even know what that is. Those are the best kept secrets in your schools. You've probably got hundreds of them sitting in bins and a lot of people don't know what to do with them. The quiz and air rods offer a lot of opportunities. Everything from prime numbers, composite numbers, learning my math tables, fractions, ratios. Uh, there's a ton of things that I can do with those. They're very visible and they really help the child if we could start with the manipulative rather than giving them the theory first and then bring the manipulative and do it in reverse. Bring out the tool and teach the theory through the tool. And once they've got the tools under wraps, then you can put up all the symbolic stuff on the board you want because they've got it. They can make the connection. But if we do it in reverse and teach me all the rules first and then say, okay, now we're going to bring these out, most of them are tuning you out because they don't see the connection. So we need to do it in reverse. Uh, pattern blocks, another one. Those are common, commonly used, but they're commonly brought out and quickly put away. And yet they are immensely helpful for fractions, especially when I'm trying to do same denominators and unlike denominators. Why do I find a common denominator? And what is a common denominator anyway? Like, what is it? And if you can't tell me that it's just a number that when you multiply the two bases together, it's a common, that's the common number I get. That's just math. But what is it? Show me what it looks like. What is a common denominator as a visual image? So that's where I can use all of these. I can use Cuisinera rods. I can use pattern blocks. Money is huge, a huge emphasis because the money offers those children who never understood place value a way to make sense of what we're doing. You can show me all the base 10 blocks in the world that you want, and I'm not saying do away with them. But in honestly, you, you will never convince me that a child who is just hanging on in math and you taught me how to use base 10 blocks and trade 10 units for a, a rod and a, 10 rods for a flat, that's process. That's memorization. And the only way I learned that is because you told me this is called a unit and this is called a rod. That's not natural. However, 10 dimes, that's real. 10 of those make one loony, that's real. 10 of those make a $10 bill. Why do I learn to trade? I learn to trade because of that. So instead of bringing out base 10 blocks, let's go back and use money. And, it's, and if you don't have money in the school, there's lots. I, this is just from an app that I use. But we made a lot of deals with Spectrum to give us bulk orders of money that could be used in the schools as a base 10 kit. So instead of using your, your uh, base 10 blocks right off the bat, I'm not saying go away with them, but maybe start with money. Um, algebra tiles, they're huge. And they're using them in grade five and in grade six, mostly in grade six but this is a place for us to use them. So they will come to you already having known the work on those or should have. So again, are those being used as the starting tool or as a add on someplace after I already showed you how to take numbers and move them around? So it's that, that whole piece about where do I see these fitting? Um, number lines and grid paper, those are huge. We use those a lot with the students. So again, transferring that, from sort of the concrete into the symbolic. So always starting sort of with that. Numbers, cards, dice, uh, dominoes, huge for learning this, the things that students need. So when we start planning this afternoon, we're gonna think about what's the end in mind? I need to be able to do all of this stuff in coordinate geometry. What's the end goal? They have to be able to show me this, 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 and this. Okay, 
So then how are you going to do that? What, what is it that I need to know? And one of the questions that came up earlier today is, you know, shouldn't we be doing pre-assessment? And the answer is you bet. That is a huge component of what you're going to do in grade seven is pre-assess first. And if they've mastered it, you do not want to spend a ton of time going through that. You want to go deeper. You want to give me a PBL that you could mark and use on the report card. Perfect. But I don't need to go back and reteach just because I had two weeks set aside to do this unit, right? One of the other things that we'll talk about, we've already talked about these a bit, so I'm just going to move on. One of the other things that we did talk about a little bit is, or will talk about is, how do you decide what goes where? How do you decide where it goes? How do you decide what your year plan goes? How do you decide how much time to put into your units right now in grade seven? And where did that come from? Do you count up the number of, and a lot of people do that. They count up the number of outcomes and divide by the number of days. That is a very common practice. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's a practice in determining how I do my year plan. But we're gonna talk about that this afternoon as well. So where do I go for some resources? We'll unpack resources even more this afternoon because you're planning. But the new Learn Alberta site obviously has resources on there that they are starting to put forward, not so much for grade seven right now, but as a grade seven teacher, I'm learning that I should be looking at the grade six materials that are being posted because there is a direct connection there of the things that they're doing and I'm doing in the classroom. So what's being shared on New Learn Alberta? The other one is the ARPDC site, and we will spend time at that one this afternoon. There is a ton of materials. Again, as a grade seven teacher, I'm paying attention to grade six because I wanna know what did you give me as a tool for a grade six teacher? I should be able to leverage that then as a grade seven teacher. And absolutely you would. So one of the things that, in case you're not with us this afternoon, one of the things that is available to you to help sort of take away the muddiness of some of the language that you rightly brought forward are these CPAR documents that I was referring to. And if you aren't familiar with them, we'll just very quickly touch on one right now. CPAR stands for Curriculum Planning and Assessment Resource. We recognized early on that there was a lot of confusion about, I don't even know what this means. And the closer we got to four, five, six, teachers were saying, I'll teach anything. I just don't even know what this is that I'm supposed to teach first. So the CPAR document provides you not a book, but it does provide you with resources and it provides you with guidance of materials that you are welcome to use in as much as you want. This is what they look like. Any CPAR document has a green cover on it. All I need to know is which CPAR am I looking for? So there is a CPAR document for every grade in every organizing idea. Now there is a timeline for some of those to be released in four, five, six, which I'll share this afternoon, but there's a ton up already. Let's just have a look at, sorry, I'm just gonna come out of this one. Let's go at to coordinate geometry because you spent a, a fair bit of time talking about that today already. Yeah, we don't wanna go there, so. Let me just grab it from here. Well, let me grab one from statistics. Let's just do that. Every CPAR document has common formatting, but not necessarily exactly everything in exactly the same way. It all starts off with the same information. You have your introductory. There's lots of links. Again, I'm not going to unpack those links right now. These are posted on the ARPDC site for you to use. But what I want to go to is here is your organizing idea guiding question and learner outcome for statistics in grade six. Below that is just a brief discussion about transfer, what we looked at in our slides. We give you sample. They're just sample. These are living documents and we're updating them as we go. But these were put together by teachers, support groups, whatever that we're working with us. So these are sample summatives that you can use. Everything in a CPAR document, when you click it on, 
can be downloaded to your computer in an editable form. They are not PDF, so that gives you a chance to go in and add, subtract, take away, put in, whatever. Below that, you will find a section called pre-assessment. So if you have, uh, and, the, and we went with what most of the school boards in the province had, we won't be able to hit everybody and it may not include you at all. But most people had the Nelson pre-assessment. So there are books already done with the pre-assessments in them based on outcome. So matched the outcomes, pre-assessments that could be used to check to see whether the students have the prerequisite skill that they need to get into the first cusp or whatever it is I'm doing. So those are outlined for you. Beside that, you have the vocabulary that is in the first cusp. See, it says 1.1. So I know that there's more than one here. Below that, you will have a section called the I can, I know statements. A number of the board said we still use those and we're expected to use those. So we included those in the documents as well. But below that is the piece that most people are kind of clamoring for and have found the most helpful. And that is on the left-hand side, you see your familiar pieces from your curriculum document. What you won't see is all of the skills and procedures. Because what we did is because you have to report the skill and procedure, the skill, we broke the skills up. Now, unless they're related, we broke them up and they each get their own examples. So that should help clarify some of the language that some of you are saying. I'm not sure what that means. It's kind of vague. So here it says interpret frequency, express relative frequencies. We included achievement indicators. Those come from your old curriculum documents. Those are familiar to us. We know what an achievement indicator is. So where we found a match, we put it in. Illustrative examples is exactly that. What does that part of the cusp look like? And you are welcome to use any of the illustrative examples in your lessons, in your examples, in your teachings, in questions for the kids, whatever you want to do. So each one of these is broken up based on the skill. If there is a teacher note at the top, such as, don't use the word experimental probability anymore. Right, We're giving you hints already in the document to help with planning in grade six. But that helps me as a grade seven teacher know that too. So any CPAR document in grade six would be helpful for me to use because it would give me a little bit of insight. The last column on the right-hand side are formative assessments. If you're looking for a quick, yeah, did they have it or not? Sometimes they're games, sometimes they're PBL, sometimes they're just quick exit slips. Um, these are just offerings of formatives that you can use. So this goes on like this for the entire cusp until you hit the last skill, whatever the skill may be. You got lots of illustrative examples there. At the bottom of the cusp, you have a section called resources. We have linked for those of you, mathology is available to all K to six teachers, which means you have access to it. It's on New Learn Alberta. So what parts can I use that would fit to this particular outcome? Um, math up, some of the school boards have purchased math up right to K to nine. So what parts in math up could I be leveraging that might help me in the grade six for the grade seven? We have made agreements with the UK who have created units for their teachers that have slide decks, lesson plans, assessments. And if there is something in here, we've linked it. This is what NCETM is. It comes from the United Kingdom and we have full permission to use their materials. We also have a section from the UK that is called Core Knowledge. These are free resources to use as teachers. They come with 